If you play a really great show in one of these watches, do you ever get superstitious and continue to wear the same watch, hoping the, the run continues? Are you like a baseball player hitting home runs? Does one watch lock and you go, I can't take it off now, I'm playing great shows? Uh... I don't know, I don't change watches that, that part of me likes the idea of like a stage outfit. I put on the same thing for every mm -hmm. gig. I, lo I love Coldplay and I love that Chris Martin always looks the same at every gig. It's got, he's got a stage outfit, he goes on, he's Chris Martin. Mm -hmm. And I like wearing the uh, ceramic, I mean, the, 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 I'm gonna flip between the white and the black ceramic for the rest of the tour, but I like being like, that's the stage yeah. watch. Um, Cause I used to, you know, I've, I've worn the 24.99 on stage. I've worn the, the That's amazing. I don't but... think anyone's worn a 24.99 <laughs> on stage. So Ben, uh, we are back for another episode of Ben Clymer Presents. I'm we are. Honor honored to be here. Yeah, Danny, this, this is fun. So th this is uh, an episode that we're recording live from a movie theater on West 57th Street in Manhattan. After we just premiered Talking Watches with, with Ed Sheeran, hosted by not me nor you, Definitely but, not me. By Mr. J.C. Mayer. That's right. And this was honestly one of the most exciting evenings I've experienced from any Hodinkee community event ever. To be in like a dark theater, everyone's got popcorn and soda or whatever it is you're drinking and just uh, enjoying one of the most entertaining and officially the longest episode of Talking Watches ever. Indeed. And, and, and in fact, you know, the, the, the title of, of this episode will be 10 Years of Talking Watches. This is actually the, the, the episode that, that marks 10 years of, of myself and, and that man right there, Will Holloway, producing these things together. Uh, so it's kind of an amazing way to mark a, a decade of, of shooting Talking Watches. Yeah, and, and speaking of, of Will, and I know that for the camera looking at us and, and for this podcast, no one will see this, but there are a few people that we should definitely shout out uh, that took that made this Talking Watches happen. Uh, so Will Holloway, please, you know, stand up for sure. Sort of the father of Talking Watches in many ways. And then the man who edited this, this absolutely epic episode, Mr. Joe Wyatt. We all clapped when his name came up on the screen. There's also a couple of um, my own colleagues, uh, Hodinkee editors. We have Mark Kozlerich right up here in the front row. Please come say hi to him after the, the screening. Yeah, if anybody wants their wrist on Hodinkee, whenever we run this, talk to talk to Mark right here. Yeah. We also have Malika Crawford somewhere in the crowd back there. We got Enery Acosta over there in the house. And we have our CEO, Jeff Fowler. So if you, you guys fi find our crew in here. Uh, he he doesn't matter, trust place. me. He's not that important. I think he's pretty cool. I think he's pretty cool, but he does pay me to say that. So that, that, that's for sure. Uh, but 10 years of talking watches. And you know what's, what's interesting that this is, this marks 10 years is because it all began with John. It did. It began with John. We ran it in late September of 2013. And, and to be clear, we, we, we didn't really plan that this would be the episode that marked 10 years, but I'm really happy it is, is, it is that episode. But, you know, the, the story of that, that first episode I've shared a few times, but I'm, I'm delighted to share it again, which was, uh, you know, John and I had become friends through, through watches some years before. And he basically texted me one day and he was like, hey, like I'm in town to do Letterman or something like that. I've got a bag full of watches. Should we shoot something? So Will and I were at an office on Barrick Street and, you know, it was, you know, probably a, an office the size of, you know, I don't know, I would say from that column to that column or, or smaller. And we're like, all right, let's just go do this. And so we ran over there. Will shot it himself with one camera. Um, and, you know, it, it was really like internet magic in a bottle. And needless to say, it, 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 it kind of launched the, this whole franchise, which is for sure, you know, the most popular and most kind of like well-regarded thing we do. Um, and in many ways kind of defines us as a brand and a business, which is just like sharing the love of these things, these watches in a way that is, we hope, really, um, really digestible, but also really like welcoming. And I think, you know, the, the John video, the first one, I think it was like, hey, you know, he had been seriously collecting and and you know for for many years and to be clear like a lot of the watches that show that were shown in talking watches two he had owned five years before when we shot talking watches one but as i said it wasn't premeditated at all so there was really like no thought given to what was there like you happen to have the 5970g which is probably the second most worn watch like the, the p is the one that i think of when i think of him so it probably should have been that there was a 6263 with a service dial in in that video it was just like the watch actually he had lent me that was the first daytona i ever got to, to wear was he, he lent me a 6263. Mm -hmm. so number two we went to his house in la and he was like, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna fucking do it, you know? And like show, showed like, you know, multi-million dollar It's Daytona. the flex episode for it's, sure. Exactly, and that, that, was, that was just super fun. Yeah, I, I, I'm assuming that it's completely inadvertent that basically every five years, John sort of marks the passage of time for Talking Watches because there've been so many episodes that happened in between, so many amazing episodes 
And I know what it's like to be a fan of Hodinkee, a reader of Hodinkee. I, I feel what it feels like to be in this room when we're watching an episode. But what do you sort of quantify to be the secret sauce of Talking Watches and why it has been sort of so, I don't want to say successful because there's yeah. no way to measure that, but just what is that secret sauce? Yeah, I just think, I mean, I just want you guys to know, and I, I don't know if this is assumed or not, but like we've never paid anybody ever to, to be on Talking Watches at all, right? And like to, to be clear, Ed, Ed Sheeran, as he said in 2017, was the most successful musician on the planet. So like he clearly did, doesn't need to be doing this, nor does John, nor do, do really any of our guys. Right. And so I think it, it like it just comes from, from pure passion as ridiculous and kind of like trite as that sounds, like it really, it is real. And these guys are taking time out of their day away from their family in, in Ed's case to, to record. And like that recording took all in probably three or four hours of, of Ed's time. And he's on tour, you know, he, he has two young daughters. Um, so it's really, it's about finding people that want to do it, A. And then finding people that like are, are engaged enough in a way that can tell the story in a way that feels good. And I think, you know, when you're talking about really expensive things that, to be clear, most of our audience, most of our staff can't afford, right. it's difficult to do that in a way that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make people feel more distant from the product than, than before seeing the video. And, I, and I, think, I think this video is great. And, you know, the 5208 is a million dollar watch, right? right? And, you know, but like when Ed says, look, like, I, you know, I wouldn't do this any year, but the year that I became the number one recording artist on the planet, it made sense. And like, it, it does make sense in that context. Uh, to some degree, I mean, it's still a million dollar watch, which is crazy. Totally is, but yep. um, um, you know, and I think you know, he it, it allows people to to celebrate their success in a way that that feels earnest. I would say. I think that's a good segue to the part of this relationship with John uh, to Hodinkee that produced the original John Mayer G Shock, because if anything, that is the most accessible watch there is, and it brings the sensibility of collecting to a different place. Um, how did something like that materialize? The original G-Shock. The original yeah, G-Shock. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, there's some folks from G-Shock here, here tonight, so hey guys, thank you. Um, you know, John is, you know, John was born in Fair, Fairfield, Connecticut, you know, which is just kind of like a middle-class town, you know, not, not too far from here with normal parents, et cetera. And, you know, the, the, that middle-class mindset that, that he has that I certainly have, I was born in upstate New York, you know, I think never really leaves you. Uh, if you're born into a world that protect Philippe's and Porsches, like, it, it, it's hard to, to, to go back, you know? And so the idea of doing something that was insanely collectible, insanely fun, and and kind of like a, a great way to demark between watch guys or gals and not was just always something that John and I wanted to do together. Yeah. Uh, you know, Houdinki had been doing swatches for, for, for many years, and those, you know, were, were really successful as well. Uh, but we wanted to do something that was really personal with John. And so obviously the first one was based on the keyboard that he had. Yeah, and we saw three of them. I think they've become collector's items in their own right. Um, and it really ties in because if you, if any of you were walking around the, the lobby when we were having drinks before this, you may have seen a yellow G-Shock floating around uh, around there. And then you saw it up here on the screen. I think it's, and you might actually see it on my wrist up here as well. Uh, <laughs> extra spoiler alert. But I mean, Ben, it's, it's honestly like just working here sometimes you have to kind of pinch yourself. It's, it's actually honestly very cool that we've been able to do something, not just with John, but then that extension, sort of the fact that they even mentioned it in the video, like John wanted to bring his friends in on this. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think, you know, John is, is really a very caring person, truly, and, and also a creative one at that. And I think, you know, having done three editions of, of the G-Shock um, was plenty, you know, and we didn't ask him to do any more than that. It was always, it was always our idea to do three and then kind of, you know, keep going or not. And like, you know, the, 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 the last one that we did, the, the kind of baby blue one, sold out the fastest. Yep. And that told us that there really was a lot of momentum left in this idea. And so we came up with this idea of Hodinkee G-Shock's legend, basically. Um, and so Ed's watch, which, which you're wearing right there, um, which was designed by him and one of his friends, you know, after one of his albums, is it, it'll, it'll, the teaser will go out for the watch tomorrow. It'll go live right. on the site in a week. You know, we expect this to just be, you know, lightning in a bottle again. I mean, it's just such a cool product. Ed it has is continues to have such a moment and is, is like universally beloved. I mean, Ed is truly one of the kindest, most kind of like normal people you could ever imagine, considering that he sells out football stadiums every weekend. Yep. Um, and so th this idea of just doing something again that will touch a whole new audience. And I think, you know, in many ways, like a lot of us, or at least I did, grew up with, with John Mayer. Like he was around. His music, I should say, was around. He was not around. I, I didn't know him until much later. Uh, his music was around when I was in high school and college. And yeah. like we, we, this generation knows him. And Ed is a different generation. He's considerably younger than, than John. 
And he represents a whole new audience. And I think if there's one thing that Hodinkee has done well from day one and continues to do well is, is get younger people, new people, into watches. And I really believe that you know the, 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 the Ed Sheeran G-Shock, which you're wearing, will get thousands and thousands of people into this space in a really organic way. And guess what? Like, if some people buy the watch and they don't get into watches, that's okay. They only spend a few hundred bucks on it. You know, it, it's not life or death here. Uh, and either way, we think they'll have a really collectible, fun thing no matter what. I don't want to give away too much, but it's not all that we kind of have in store for this year either. Yes. You know, just for, for those in the crowd, keep your keep your eyes on Hodinkee, you know, through the end of the year. Yeah. Because there'll be some some fun to be had. Yeah, there'll, there'll be a, a lot of a lot of fun things to come. Yeah. potentially more in the Casio realm. Um, but you know, it's we we want to do stuff that that connects these people organically. These people being the collaborators in, in John's kind of legacy series here uh, to their own lives and and to the community. Um, so you know, first comes for, first things first. The, the Ed Watch comes out next week. Yep. Um, you know, we expect it to be a runaway hit for sure. We're going to open this up for a Q&A shortly, but I kind of want to kick it off with a question to you that sort of goes back again to the first episode of Talking Watches, which I think, speaking to a lot of people in the community, was a, a honestly a serious touch point for entering watch enthusiasm because John being just the, the gravity that's around him, not to, no pun intended, but just like who he is as a musician. Yeah. Um, people got into watches through him. They understood watches through him, through the video you both did together. How have you seen collecting and enthusiasm changed since a decade ago. Yeah, it, it, I mean, look, there, there's the obvious things, and like I could be kind of like the, the snarky old guy on, on his Do it. Kind of, this know. is the platform for No, it. look, I mean, I think like the, the, the homogenization of like what people want is a, is a real big bummer, right? It, it, it just is. And so the idea that like people only want Nautiluses and Royal yeah. Oaks and Daytona, I was like, I get it, I have all those watches, they're great, you should totally get them, they're awesome. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's just like, you know, five years ago, IWC was really strong. Jaeger was really strong. Longa wasn't strong, but had a lot of love behind it. And now it, and, and those, some of those brands are doing well, so, some are not. Um, but, you know, the idea that if you go on Instagram, like, all you see are the same five watches over and over again. And that, that's a bummer, for sure. And I think, like, a, a big part of why Houdinki does what we continue to do is, to, is to, to, to kind of, like, undo a little bit of that. And so shining a light on a, you know, a Recep Recepi as we did today, and granted it's a half a million dollar watch in, in, in that case, but like at least it's something different and at least there's craftsmanship to point to to say this is why that watch is worth 450,000 Swiss, right? It's a sonar, it's a chronograph, it's a tourbillon, all handmade, blah, yep. blah, blah. You know, that, that's a really different story than saying like a, a 5711R Tiffany sign is worth half a million dollars, which it was at one point, yeah. which is just insanity to me. So, you know, things have changed a lot. I mean, the, the, the industry has grown so much, and I'm incredibly excited and happy about that, of course. But I think that there still remains a really great um, positive sentiment around uh, watch collectors. I think if you go on Instagram, like there is, you know, kind of overt negativity here and there, but that tends to exist only on Instagram and only on the internet. Those guys come offline and come to something like this, and they're incredibly friendly. And that just, I mean, that, you know, that there's a lot to explore there, of course. But I think for, for us, like, the, the, the love for the game is still there. The love for the product is still there. I still love Houdinki. I still love creating stuff like this yep. with, with friends and working with you guys. Um, so ultimately, it's bigger and, and better than ever. Um, and I, I do think that we will start to see the dissipation of that kind of, like, really homogenous um, aesthetic. Yeah, you and I were talking about, I think, releases like that Recep Louis Vuitton watch signal, I think, a shift in, in, the, in a few ways into that realm appreciating sort of crazier objects that you don't necessarily have to be able to afford, right. but can appreciate the craftsmanship, appreciate what it's doing and how it's progressing the industry. Um, I'd love if we could open up the, the audience for Q&A, um, pass a microphone around and uh, yeah, field some questions. Hi, uh, Adam Moore here, how you doing? I'm good, Adam, how are you? Hey, Adam. Nice to see you, thanks for having us. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point out that in the talking watches that we just watched, there was a lot of focus on the uh, brand called Toy Watch. Yes. And I wanted to ask you guys what your Toy Watch was. In other words, before, you know, Ben, obviously the Omega uh, Speedmaster mm -hmm. that your grandfather had was a big inspiration for you. But before you got into watches, before you even knew what watches were, yeah. What was your toy watch? Because I had a red toy watch, <laughs> and I forgot that I had it until 
I watched this because it was before I was into watches. So it's amazing you say that because I actually also had a toy watch that I forgot that I had uh, until I saw the, the clip of this video and, until we recorded. But that was that was much later. My, my kind of toy watch was, there were really a few. I had, a, I had a bunch of Casios, and I mean that sincerely. I had a, a remote control Casio watch, which I still have. Uh, my father actually brought it to my 40th birthday party, so I could see that. Um, I had a Nautica. I was really into Nautica back in the day. A Nautica collaboration with, with Timex, actually, that had Indiglo. Uh, I wore that watch every day for years. And I had a Swiss Army Victorinox, almost tank-style watch. That, and all of which I still have, to be clear. I don't wear a ton, but I still have them. Um, those were the th would be the three for me. First of all, hey, Adam, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, for me, there's two. One was a watch that when I look back at basically any photo of myself from ages, I don't know, six to 10, it was a shark freestyle watch, you know, with the Velcro strap on it in, in black, because, you know, I guess I just like didn't want to go too crazy as a seven-year-old. Um, and, and, and then my first uh, like semi-serious kids watch was um, oddly enough, a Swatch collaboration with, with the golfer Sergio Garcia uh, way back in, I think, the year 2001. I think I, picked, I got that watch. That's a weird choice. It's very strange. It's very, but you know what? It looked, it was like a blue diver style watch on a, bra a blue bracelet. It was the crate, like a navy blue bracelet. Crazy watch, but that's, uh, you, you don't get to, to choose them. Uh, how, what your taste is when you're 10. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Hey, Ben, uh, glad you mentioned John's open letter to IWC, which yeah. I guess was maybe around eight, nine years ago at this yeah. point. Have you spoken to him at all about how IWC has changed since he's written that letter, you know, the direction it's gone in, or his thoughts or even your thoughts on IWC today? Uh, we haven't spoken about it recently. I mean, when that letter came out, that created like a whole shitstorm for me. I can tell you that. And, and sooner or later, I'll, I'll tell that story. But that was like a real problem for me for, for a while there. Uh, look, IWC... Has, has course corrected in many ways. I mean, we did a collaboration with them, you know, a few years later, probably four or five years later. That remains one of my favorite limited editions all the time. Both John and Ed both, both own them, and you can see them wearing it all the time. Um, I think there's a lot of great stuff in IWC now. Uh, I think, you know, they're, they're a brand that I think in many ways, like, has been... Uh, what I, I always think about, like, when I used to work at UBS. I used to work at a bank you know, now 16, 17 years ago. And IWC, the Portuguese are in particular, the, you know, the eight-day was kind of the anti-Rolex. And so when you made your first, whatever, $3,000 bonus as an associate at UBS, like you'd either buy a Samariner, which you could just walk into the store and buy, or the Portuguesa. And that doesn't really exist anymore. I know that the brand is doing well, um, but it, it, it hasn't you know, kind of taken off the same way that, that a lot of other brands around it has. And I think, you know, a lot of it is just the sheer power of, of Rolex, which is, you know, they're, they're direct competitor in that price category, obviously. And then Omega has done very well as well, being kind of like the anti-Rolex now. So there's, there's still a long way to go for IWC. And I'm in many ways, and I, I say this realizing that probably 50% of this audience is wearing a Rolex. Like, I am more excited to see people wearing an IWC than a Rolex. You know, it's just, it's just because I, I see, I'm exposed to so many watches and such a huge percentage are Rolex. Um, so I think, I think there's a long way to go, um, but I, I still think they're, they're doing pretty well. I love the ceramic stuff. Uh, I really like the tribute to 3705. I bought that. I just bought it online, paid retail for it. Like, I think it's a great watch. I still have a 3705, the original. Um, the ceramic stuff in particular is, is really neat. You know, ceramic in general, I mean, AP, we saw Ed with the, the piece unique white ceramic. Um, that's some cool stuff. And I, I think IWC was early to that. We, we know they were early to that with the 3705. Um, and I, I think there's a real history there that they should continue to explore. Cool. Thank you very much. Sure. Hello. Uh, Hi. Hi, my name is Alexis. Uh, so first of all, I think it's the first time I had the chance to see the team at Hodinkee and the founding members. So thank you for everything. Thank you for Hodinkee in general, the event, uh, talking watches. Uh, honestly, it's great and it's part of the watchmaking journey now. Thank you. Uh, a bit more on the question now. Uh, first on the episode, I think that uh, not only I watch, I had the chance of watching a talking watch episode, it's also I felt like I was part of a dinner conversation just randomly between John and Ed, which I think is a great transition for the format in general. Mm -hmm. And on the questions, um, so I, from my understanding, uh, John had a lot of fun doing this and had a lot of fun designing the G-Shock collab. Um, he's part of the pool of investors that took on Hodinkee. Mm -hmm. From conversation with him, is he getting more invested into Hodinkee in general? Uh, does he want to be part more of the episode than of the 
creative direction. And the second question is on talking watches in general. Here, you celebrated an anniversary. You put John and Ed at the same time. Yeah. I guess it's a great asset for Hodinki to have talking watches, but it's also a responsibility. How do you treat rarity of episodes? Who is going to present what? Mm -hmm. uh, at what point do you allow a certain person to go on to talk in watches? Mm -hmm. It would be great to have an insight. Sure. In, in, in terms of John's in, involvement with, with Hodinki, I mean, I think it will remain kind of status quo for the foreseeable future, which is like he's around all the time. But, you know, he... You know, he lives in Los Angeles, we're in New York, um, he, he has a, a, a career and, and a meaningful one at that. So I, I don't, you know, I, this is not, and I'm being, you know, obviously very sincere here, like this is not the, the beginning of him appearing monthly on, on Hodinky or anything like that. You know, I, I got to know Ed through John. Uh, I've known Ed for six or seven years, and I think, in fact, the very first story he wrote for us, which mentioned a lot of the watches that, that we had on there, he said, hey, you know, I'll see you for talk. I'll see you for talking watches in, in some amount of time. But I think, you know, when I met Ed, he was probably early 20s, right? I mean, album two, album three, something like that, you know, really quite young and his fans tended to be even younger. And so the idea of him uh, going on camera and saying, hey, here's a, you know, here's a meaningful amount of money invested in watches just like didn't really sit well with him or his audience. You know, John has been very famous for a very long time. And so it's, it's just really different in terms of like the digestibility of, of John versus Ed in, in the public sphere. Um, and so when, when we did, when we thought about doing the, the, the Ed episode, I mean, I easily could have hosted it for sure. Um, but I, I think it, it just seemed to make sense um, that, that John step in to, to host this one because he kind of brought Ed into my life and he brought Ed into the, the watch world in so many ways. I mean, you saw that like he gave him a Daytona for Christmas and he bought a, Ed bought a 5970 because they saw each other backstage at the Grammys, you know, six or seven years ago. Um, so it just made sense for, for, for John to host that one. So his role within the company, you know, won't, won't change in, in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, and then Talking Watches as, as, a, as a product within Hodinkee, all of our editors are completely entitled to, to host them whenever we kind of think it makes sense. Uh, I certainly do not have, you know, some sort of domain over that. Like, it's, it's really whatever kind of makes the most sense. Sometimes people request certain editors and we're happy to, to oblige. Sometimes people just, you know, the schedules don't align. Uh, as you wouldn't be surprised to learn, getting... Uh, getting everybody into a room, John and Ed in this case, in, in New York City was was pretty fucking challenging. <laughs> you know, just getting people together. Uh, the schedules, you know, working, booking out a, a, a studio. We actually had another studio booked and then somebody took, uh, took that time. I'm not going to tell you who, but it was somebody very famous. Um, I mean, just, you know, crazy stuff that like, just like life gets in the way. We're like, hey, like maybe, you know, Danny was going to host X, Y, and Z and then he had to go travel because of something. It just, it just happens. But, you know, we, we are not that precious with Talking Watches in the sense that, like, all of our editors are entitled. You'll see episodes hosted by, you know, some of the editors here very soon. Um, but, you know, we, we are more precious with the guests that appear on them than with our own edits. You know, if, if, we, if we think enough of any editor to hire them full time, then they're more than, than um, welcome to host an episode. But we are really thoughtful with who we put on, uh, on, on, on one of these episodes. There's only, like, there's only one or two I'd like to take back after 10 years. Uh, there are one or two, you can guess who. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it happens. That, that's life, you know. Thank you. Hey, uh, John Picciuto. Um, as a person who came to the site because of you, Ben, I'm wondering what the likelihood is or the possibility that we get a John Mayer-hosted Ben Clymer <laughs> guest episode of Talking Watch. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's not zero, uh, but I think like here he, here's the thing, like you know, I, I might be like you know like micro famous in like the watch community. Like I'm not a famous guy. I don't have security at my house like these guys do. You know, it's it's just a really different thing for me. And like granted, I am hyper exposed on the internet, on Instagram and and whatever. But like, you know, I don't. I, it's just it's just like you know, I'm a pretty understated kind of like shy guy, and so exposing. I was about to say exposing myself, but exposing my collection in, in that way is just not something that I'm like super anxious to do. And like, I think if, you know, James and I did a little episode zero of my podcast, like I, I view my role as the, the guy um, uh, that kind of like facilitates. I use the word lubricate on the podcast. He's like, don't use that word. Uh, that, that facilitates people to, to get out there and share stuff more so than the guy that, that shares. I think that's what I'm best at. Like I've had a bunch of watches. I, I still have quite a few. And there, there might be some version of me sharing my collection in, in the, you know, I'm not going to say near term, but at some point before the, this, this uh, ride ends, whenever that ends. Um, but again, it, it's just, it's, it's not in my nature to share that much. I mean, like, 
people think that I talk about watches, my own watches on the site all the time. I really don't. Like I almost have never said, hey, I bought the new you know, G-Shock or whatever, here's why. And in fact, I've probably done that two or three times in the course of the past 15 years. Uh, people understand what I own because of Instagram and because of like little interviews I give, et cetera. Uh, but it's, it's not something I'm, I'm dying to do. But again, I'm not like, I'm not vehemently opposed to it. It just has to make sense. And I think it has to make sense um, in the broader scope of what Hodinkee's up to, what I'm up to in my own life. Um, but yeah, again, it's non-zero, but I'm, you know, I, I can tell you honestly, it won't happen in the next six to 12 months. It might happen after that, um, but, but open to it for sure. Hi. Hey. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have is you've had this series for like a decade and later in the years, what's the line, because it's a fine line that you like have to face or just deal with with the diversity uh, diversification of guests that you get. Mm -hmm. I say that because I come from a hip hop background. Yeah. I grew up wearing Tim's. I grew up listening to hip hop music, and a lot of the stuff that became popular in terms of, I guess, to the public is because of these songs. Yeah. So, how do you walk that line of person that's like really in, inside baseball into these watches, but also? balancing this mainstream like phenomenon because yeah. you seem very like you know into the like the origin of this stuff but mm -hmm. at the same time it's getting so fast where it, like you said it's the ig effect and everything else yeah yeah it's, it's a great question i mean i think for us we look for people that a like you know really just love it and i think like that that's paramount to everything else like guys and gals that really just want to talk about it and share it and you know, the, this, the sad truth of, of most of it is like sometimes people come to us via their agent or manager and those conversations just like just don't go that well, honestly, because like, OK, well, how much do we get? Or like, you know, what watch do we get to pick out of the out of the Hodinkee safe or whatever to do this? Uh, and that that's really challenging. And that happens like more than you would think. Uh, so the, the the talking watches that that you've seen, I mean, almost all of them have come from like a personal introduction to myself, to Will, to Danny, to, to somebody else. So it's like somebody that we know or you know, as a friend of a friend, and all of a sudden, like, that person just becomes kind of part part of the universe. Um, seldom do we go out to people. In fact, I don't know that we've ever really gone out to anybody. Will, any? No, Shake, shaking his head no. Um, that's about as much you'll get from Will Holloway in a night, by the way. Um, but, um, you know, so in many cases, it, it's pretty organic. It's just like, okay, like, we met, you know, I, I met Ed through John, um, and it just feels like, okay, like it's, it's frankly like a multi-year conversation. I mean, it, in, in Ed's case, it's probably five to six years. In John's case, I mean, I met him in 2010. We did it, so three plus years. And John and I were super close back then. We talked every day. Um, so, you know, it, it is like, it's not, um, it's, not like, it's not like being booked on The Tonight Show or something like that, where it's like, hey, like I've got a book to promote, let's do talking watches. It's more of like people that like just kind of in, in the orbit. Um, but the, the goal is to be, you know, as kind of like arms open and welcoming as, as possible, for sure. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for, ha uh, for joining us tonight. Um, again, thank you. Um, thank you, guys. Shout out to everybody that made tonight uh, possible. There are so many Hodinkee uh, folks in the house tonight that, that really made it happen. And thank you for, for reading Hodinkee. Okay.